From the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, this is Space Shuttle Endeavor Launch Control. The countdown for the launch of Endeavor on Space Shuttle Mission STS-68 is continuing on the schedule this morning. Again, the final inspection team is continuing to conduct their final portions of the work at the pad, and they will be departing the pad shortly to make their final report to the launch director. No issues have come up in the wake of their assessments, and everything continues to look good. As the crew completes their breakfast, they will soon be donning their flight suits and entry suits, and the commander and pilot will be given a final briefing on today's weather outlook. Starting with our commander, Mike Baker. All are being assisted with uh, their suits by Kennedy Space Center and Johnson Space Center technicians. Uh, these personnel are experts in the understanding of the details on how these suits work. Pilot today is Terry Wilcutt. He'll be making his first trip into space on Shuttle Endeavor. Mission specialist, mission specialist Steve Smith is making his first trip into space today also. He appears ready to fly. Ready to go up. The bright orange colored suits are basically an altitude protection system. And of course they're checked out prior to launch. Payload commander Tom Jones making his second trip into space. His first trip was just this past April. Mission specialist Jeff Weisoff making his second trip into space today. And mission specialist Dan Birch making his second trip into space today. Making preparations on his suit to make sure that it pressurizes as it should. Checking all the straps and loops. Following launch and while on orbit, the crew members change out of these suits into more conventional and comfortable clothing. However, they are required to return to these suits prior to, prior to landing. This is shuttle launch control. We are now at T-minus three hours and counting. Everything continues to look good for our launch this morning at 7.16 a.m. from pad 39A with the Space Shuttle Endeavor on mission STS-68. This is Shuttle Launch Control at T-minus two hours, 50 minutes and counting, and we have our six-member crew on the third floor of the Operations and Checkout Building. They have been suited, and they're ready to take that 20-minute trip out to the pad. Getting on the elevator, they'll be going down to the first floor, uh, at which time they'll be entering the crew astro van. And our crew are walking out of the operations checkout building on their way to pad 39A. Mike Baker, pilot Terry Wilcox, and mission specialist Tom Jones, Jeff Weissel, Steve Smith, and Dan Burke. This is shuttle launch control at T-minus two hours, 34 minutes, and counting. And the astrovan with the astronaut crew members inside has arrived at the base of pad 39A. And they are at this time disembarking from the astronaut van. And once they're all gathered in the elevator, they'll make the trip up to the 195-foot level of the fixed service structure and begin their ingress into the orbiter. Pad 39A is the southernmost pad of NASA's two shuttle launch facilities, and it is nearly identical to Pad 39B, which is located just about a mile to the north. It looks like our crew members have uh, deviated a little bit from their uh, 
desire to go straight up to the orbiter, and they're going to stand beneath the mobile launcher platform and have a quick picture taken of them. And we are at T-minus nine minutes and holding. And all of our sites are observe go and forecast go as far as weather is concerned. We're just a few seconds away from resuming the countdown for the launch of Space Shuttle Endeavour this morning. Three, two, one. And we're at T-minus nine minutes and counting. And the ground launch sequencer has been initiated. NASA test director Bill Dowdell is about to call for the transmittal of stored pre-launch commands. As Endeavour is only nine minutes from its seventh mission in space, on board is the Space Radar Laboratory and a crew of six astronauts. T-minus seven minutes, 30 seconds, and the orbiter access arm is now being retracted away from the vehicle. This is the walkway used by the crew to gain entry into and out of the vehicle and can be returned to position within seconds if need be. And final aerosurface checks of the orbiter flaps and rudder are being completed. This verifies the orbiter's hydraulic systems. And the three main engines are being gimbaled as a final test before launch. T minus two minutes, 30 seconds. Still unexpected air, so that's complete. Copy that. All is ready to fly today on NASA's four and a half million pound space shuttle vehicle. TC, close and lock your visors and initiate O2 flow. This time we're gonna get you airborne. Good luck, gentlemen. Roger, that work, thanks. We'll see you in 10 days. PLS is go for ET LHT pressurization. T minus one minute, 50 seconds. Everything continues to look good for launch this morning as the Space Shuttle Endeavour soon will begin its 10-day mission to continue its radar mapping expedition and study environmental changes on Earth. And we have a go for auto sequence start. Endeavour's onboard computers have primary control of all the vehicle's critical functions. T minus 20 seconds. 15. 12. 11. 10. 9. 8. 7. We have a go for main engine start. 4. 3. 2. 1 and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavour on a mission to study the Earth's ever-changing environment. Houston now controlling. Roger, roll, Endeavour. Endeavour's roll maneuver is underway. Vehicle's now in a head-down position on course for a 57 degree, 120 nautical mile orbit. Approaching two minutes into the flight, the next event is burnout and separation of the solid rocket boosters. SRB separation is confirmed. Endeavour's altitude is 170,000 feet. Downrange from the launch site, 32 nautical miles. Now traveling 4,400 feet per second or about 3,000 miles per hour. Three and a half minutes now into Endeavour's mission. 
The orbiter is downrange from the launch site, 91 nautical miles, traveling 4,400 miles per hour at an altitude of 306,000 feet. Endeavour Houston, we see a nominal, nominal Miko, Holmes 1, not required. Roger, nominal Miko, Holmes 1, not required. This is Mission Control Houston. We're now receiving some videotape from the Space Shuttle Endeavour of the external tank as it drifts away from the Shuttle Endeavour following today's 6.16 a.m. Central Time launch from Kennedy Space Center. This tape being sent down to us through the Merritt Island Tracking Station on the coast of Florida. Off confirmed. Copy. Houston Endeavour, roll program. Roger, roll, Endeavour. In flight guidance, we see the roll. Copy, guidance. Throttle up, 3 at 104. Copy. Endeavour, Houston. go at throttle up. Endeavour, go at throttle up. Roger, go at throttle up. That's our BSEP. Copy, SRB set. 103 converged. Single engine press, 104. Endeavour, single engine press, 104. Single engine press, 104. Endeavour Houston, we copy all. Thanks. Good morning, I have uh, moved to block 12. The answer to block 12 is uh, no, I have not disabled the messages. I'll stand by for uh, block 13 with your go. All right, we copy. Let's look at it.
Now let's talk about the first uh, of the two experiments. The first experiment is called BRIC. It's Biological Research in Canisters. And it's sponsored by the United States Department of Agriculture. There are five canisters, aluminum canisters like this on board. Within each canister, there are 1,000 gypsy moth eggs. So we have 5,000 gypsy moth eggs flying with us here on Endeavor. Now you might ask, why do we have gypsy moth eggs on uh, Endeavor? It turns out that the gypsy moth is, very is a very destructive pest in the United States, especially to northeast hardwood, hardwood forests. So the United States Department of Agriculture has a goal of controlling the population of gypsy moths in that area. Now, the way they control gypsy moth population is by introducing sterile gypsy moths into the wild. They've tried to produce sterile gypsy moths on the ground, but it's a very difficult process and also very time-consuming. We also don't know exactly the mechanism within the gypsy moths that makes them sterile, but we do have a ground process that works. Well, by, by accident, we have actually found out that gypsy moth eggs, if they are carried in space flight, produce sterile gypsy moths. We don't quite under understand the mechanism, and that's the goal of this experiment. If we take these 5,000 gypsy moth eggs with us and give them back to the USDA after the flight, they should produce sterile gypsy moths, and the USDA will be able to look at those gypsy moths and understand the exact mechanism that creates their sterility. Now, they wouldn't want us to grow sterile gypsy moths in uh, space for introduction to the wild in mass populations, but they would like to understand the mechanism that creates sterility and hopefully reproduce it on the ground. So there's one example how going away from the Earth's surface actually can be used to solve a problem we have on Earth. So that's the first of the two experiments. The second experiment I'd like to discuss with, discuss with you today is called the Commercial Protein Crystal Growth Experiment, or CPCG, and it's sponsored by the University of Alabama. Now, before I get into the details, let me tell you that the goal of this experiment, it's flown 32 times on the shuttle, by the way, is to either create new drugs or to improve drugs we already have. Now, drug design in the United States now is based on a sophisticated process called structural-based drug design. That's where experimenters, rather than taking a sample of a disease and applying different drugs to it in a somewhat haphazard way, actually study the disease's structure study the drugs that they might consider would solve that disease until so they just fit together. So they actually look at the structure of this crystal or drug to try and find out what exactly fits into that disease that actually would cure that disease. Now, the National Institute of Health has named structural-based drug design as one of their number one priorities in the next 10 years. Now, unfortunately, in some cases where we grow crystals on the ground, again, trying to analyze the crystals to um, heal this disease, the crystals cannot be grown on the ground because of uh, gravity. Well, the good news is that in space, we don't have gravity, and we can grow crystals for the scientists. Okay, what I have here is a picture on the bottom of a ground-based crystal grown. And on the top is a crystal grown in space. Now, these photos are the same magnification of the same drug. So you can see that these crystals on the ground, grown on the ground, were limited in size and quality, whereas the crystals grown in space are much bigger and much better quality. Therefore, space flight produces crystals that are better quality and larger. Scientists can then, can then take the crystals on the ground and analyze them. Now, on our flight, we're flying something called alpha interferon. It's already a very successful drug around the world used in 60 countries to treat various forms of cancer and also viral diseases. However, remember that the goal of CPCG is either to help discover new drugs or to improve current drugs. And in our case, we're trying to improve alpha interferon. And when you try to improve a drug, you're basically trying to eliminate some of the side effects. So now, that's the second experiment I've decided, described to you. And it's an excellent example of how we go into space to improve our lives on Earth and to solve problems we have on Earth. So when you think of NASA and the shuttle program going up into space, we go away from the Earth's surface to actually help our families and friends in the world on the ground.
Houston. At this point, we'd like to future load Fox. Good point, Jeff. Thanks. Okay. Flip the road switch. I'm doing that. I'm pushing that. I'm horizontal head calibration trial number two. Go right to the green center, left to the green center. Release. Good. Okay. There I'll pan over here and show the target, too. Okay, horizontal head calibration, trial number two. Oh, you can see the little dot on there. Horizontal head calibration trial number three. We'd like to take a look at the uh, function of the pilot side uh, panel trim enable switch. Flip it up to enable and then back to inhibit for us, please. And Mario, a little bit more about one of the medical experiments we're uh, participating in. You may have noticed the uh, device that's on Dan and my uh, wrist. It's called the Actilome. And it's uh, part of the DSO 4 and 4 that Lex, which is sponsoring. And not only are they monitoring, uh, the melatonin levels in our uh, urine and, and saliva. They're also monitoring the light levels that we're exposed to. Light apparently uh, controls the production of melatonin. So the devices that we have on our wrists are actually measuring the light levels that we're exposed to 24 hours a day. In addition to measuring our levels of activity, there's some accelerometers in these devices, and so it measures the, uh, our level of activity during the day, and they're particularly interested in the level of activity while we're sleeping. It uh, can tell them whether we're sleeping very well or not. And uh, therefore, that's a good measure of how well we're uh, adjusting our time clocks. Uh, pretty much count on looking at the imagery after the mission. We don't have ready access to NASA Select. But we're very excited about the work that you're doing. And uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing you after you get back to Mother Earth.
burn some of their circuit boards. minutes here at the end of the ship where I'd like to tell you about our uh, activities on board, uh, tell you about the major components of the Space Radar Laboratory, talk about our science goals uh, for the week's activities, and tell you about some of the examples of global change that uh, we look forward to sharing with the people and the scientists back on Earth. This uh, Space Radar Lab 2 is part of NASA's mission to planet Earth. Uh, that's a program that NASA's conducting to look at Earth's life, land, water, the air around the planet, and all the interactions of those components. We're trying to understand uh, Earth as a single complex system so that we can get a handle on the real numbers behind uh, the changes our globe is experiencing. Now, sp the Space Radar Lab's goal as a part of Mission to Planet Earth is to look for those hard numbers on Earth's changes, both man-made and natural, 
try to bring those back to Earth so we can understand how we're affecting the planet and how we have to cope with those changes. Now, to do that, we have a payload bay full of sophisticated instruments that last flew uh, in April on STS-59. And I'd like to tell you a bit about those, and I've got a little video segment here to show you those uh, components. The first uh, component we have on board Space Radar Lab is a uh, state-of-the-art imaging radar. And uh, we're going to show you here in this view as we come down from the overhead windows our Cersei XR radar out in the payload bay. The other component of uh, SRL is the MAPS air pollution sensor. And in this view of the payload bay, you can see the large radar array stretching from about the uh, forward end of the bay all the way back to the tail. Uh, it's labeled JPL. That's the Cersei XR instrument. The Langley Research Center uh, logo is on the MAPS instrument just to the right of the screen uh, to the left of the Canadian uh, arm. And the small segment of antenna labeled uh, XR is the German-built component of Space Radar Lab. Now, these sensors in the cargo bay aren't very useful unless uh, we have the crew here on board to operate them. For the imaging radar part of the mission, the crew has an essential role to play. Uh, there's a huge amount of data coming down from the instrument out there as it images the Earth's surface. And those images have to be transferred to the ground. We don't have enough communications link on board to transfer them all in real time. So the first role of the crew is to handle the data coming back from the radar. And we do that by changing out our data tapes on board. We have about 207 data tapes on board. Each of them holds 50 uh, gigabytes of data. And we've gotten uh, very good at practicing changing out those tapes. We hope to bring back about 52 terabits of data, something like 20,000 encyclopedia volumes of information by the time we're finished. The second uh, part of the uh, crew's role is to handle the photography that supports the science investigations around the world. In many regions of the world, we don't have scientific teams on the ground to validate the results from the radar or from the MAPS pollution sensor. And so we are the ground truth. Our photography from 14,000 still photo frames is going to be used to provide the, the uh, environmental conditions over those targets in remote areas of the globe who don't have independent verification. And the last thing we're doing, and probably the most important role that the crew's playing on this mission, is to point the payload bay instruments at the required targets. And to do that, we're conducting a succession of maneuvers, about 409 of them during the mission. And that's about 25,000 computer keystrokes to tell Endeavour's computers how to orient the payload bay so as to get the optimum data coming back down to the ground. Now, the radar out in the cargo bay, Cersei XR, is a synthetic aperture radar, and it paints a picture of the Earth's surface through darkness and clouds and can thus operate around the clock all the way around our orbits every 90 minutes around the globe. The MAPS pollution sensor is an infrared uh, spectrometer, and it measures the amount of heat radiation coming up from the ground and converts that into information on how much carbon monoxide is lying just beneath the space shuttle as we go around the planet. And over a couple of days, we can construct a map of pollution sources and the way the CO is moving around the world on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is a very good comparison with information we got last spring and on two previous flights of MAPS. And this is just the key to our whole mission, just looking for changes around the world. We're looking for changes since last April's STS-59 mission, Space Radar Lab 1. We're looking for changes in the previous MAPS data over the last 10 years. And these two flights and other flights in NASA's mission to planet Earth will show the ability to monitor the Earth as a global system on a permanent basis. We're looking for changes like uh, ecology changes, changes around the world, climate changes, and some dramatic changes on the surface that we're more familiar with, like volcanoes and storm systems, for example. In the area of ecology, we're looking at clearing and deforestation around the world, looking at the tropical and northern forests of the world to see the rate at which we're destroying the forests and the rate at which they're renewing themselves, so we can really quantify that important phenomenon in, in the ecosystem. We've already seen a lot of forest fires over in Asia and in Australia, some at night over Africa and in uh, South America as well. And our data, when we come back, will give us the rates of forest change around the world. In terms of pollution, we're looking for the way that carbon monoxide drifts around the world from its sources like forest fires, and that will help us track seasonal. We're looking for climate change by looking at the geology around the world, for traces in the geologic past of rainier, rainier and drier periods in the Earth's deserts, 
and the uh, valleys that show alluvial fan erosion. Those are very key uh, points to investigate for looking back into the Earth's climatic past. Before, and we've also been looking at several storm systems down in the Southern Ocean that uh, we tr can track on a day-to-day -day basis. And there are targets for both the radar and some of the MAPS instruments because they, uh, those storm systems can distribute pollution around the world. We have a busy week ahead of us here on Space Radar Lab. We've got a lot of work to do in terms of maneuvering, changing the tapes, and most important for us on a daily basis is taking all those still, still photos from the uh, aft windows. It keeps us constantly busy when there's a, a daylight pass going on. That's not surprising. The Earth is a very complex system. It takes a lot of study to understand it, and only um, a future permanent platform or a suite of instruments in orbit is going to be able to do that on a permanent basis. And we hope that by flying this test bed, we'll prove that that principle will in fact work. Uh, we're getting a taste of some of the exciting results that we're anticipating here in orbit with our own eyes. And it's uh, going to be an exciting look at the data when we get back to the ground with those 207 data tapes and really see in full fidelity what the uh, Circe XR and MAP sensors have brought back. But we can see the changes here, and we're going to try to share them with you in the coming weeks. Okay, Houston, you should be getting this uh, view of um, the uh, Kluzhskoye volcano. You can see the, uh, the snow-capped upper slopes, and then there's a very active eruption going on from the uh, northeast portion of the mountain. Uh, uh, Bezignani is behind the smoke plume. Uh, well, looks like from the shadow heights, you can even estimate the height of the eruption plume, but uh, we're guessing at at least 35 or 40,000 uh, feet. And uh, that dark gray dust plume goes down wind at least 500 kilometers, if not more. Okay, now this is a, a going away shot, Houston, of the um, volcano. You can still see the lava flows at the top of the screen where the eruption is actually originating. And uh, this gives you a good view of, this, of the profile of the plume. And there's another wide shot that Dan took uh, starting just now that shows you the extent of the uh, ash plume. This is Mission Control Houston. We uh, are receiving some uh, data from the uh, Space Radar Laboratory instruments. This particular data is uh, coming down real time, or near real time, and is uh, data as of the uh, Kamchatka Peninsula. The orbiter is flying over this peninsula that is uh, to the uh, east of Russia and on the uh, western side of the Bering Sea. Houston Endeavor, you should be getting that video now. That's firm, Dan. It's, uh, once again, really just a fantastic video image. From the synthetic aperture radar instrument on board Endeavor as it passes over the Raco, Michigan supersite. These are live pictures from the XR instrument. Rico, Michigan is one of the ecology sites being studied. The, uh, the ground looks just like it did then. We have a beautiful mosaic of fall colors beginning to, to develop. And you should be beginning to see uh, lots of reds and yellows as you look down over our site in the days to come. You know, we, last night... We we'll certainly be looking for it. The lighting so far has made it a little hard to distinguish colors, but we have noticed a little bit greener inland um, and near the coastal lines of the Great Lakes. It's looked a little bit more fall-like. Well, that should be proceeding along rather quickly now. We've had two nights of good hard frost with clear weather and the drying, so fall is coming quickly upon us. Uh, 
and Endeavor is now moving across the uh, northwestern portions of Africa. Again, uh, using the synthetic aperture radar, it's very evident that the orbiter is now crossing uh, over land. This is a geological site, uh, a super site again, over the Sahara Desert area. Uh, the Sahara is an area which is about the size of the uh, United States. Prior to its becoming a desert area, it had been uh, apparently uh, well laden with uh, fairly major drainage networks. Uh, with uh, increasing dominance of the wind and the sands and the channels and the various floodplains of the rivers uh, began to be reworked into thin sheets and eventual scattered dunes. This is Mission Control Houston. We're now receiving some additional real-time downlink from the synthetic aperture radar instrument in Endeavour's payload bay as it flies 118 nautical miles over the coast of Japan. With us again is Dr. Jeffrey Plout, the geology representative for Circe XR. Dr. Plout, what are we looking for in these XR images? Well, at this point, uh, we're traveling over the Sea of Japan, and this is a, an inland uh, body, of, uh, not an inland body. Of, uh, this is uh, the strait between the main northern tip of the island of Hokkaido. Uh, which uh, was the vicinity of the offshore earthquake earlier today. Dr. Platt, is there any possibility we'll see any change in the shoreline because of the waves that have been in the area? That is the type of observation that uh, we would be interested in making, and in this case, perhaps uh, looking for ponded water or any bright returns, uh, bright radar returns from the near shore area. Here we're coming over the southwest corner, and then beyond in the top of the screen there is the northeast section of the island, and uh, there's no obvious evidence of damage, but this is uh, going by rather fast, and we'd certainly need more time to sit down and do a, a detailed processing and analysis of the image. And the uh, next data take underway with the synthetic aperture radar in Endeavour's payload bay as the orbiter tracks northeast now, uh, approaching the Great Lakes region. The uh, RACO Michigan Supersite is located uh, on the eastern end of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. The uh, particular site of interest is uh, located between uh, forested regions and the northern temperate forest, which is uh, known as a transitional zone that is uh, expected to be ecologically sensitive to global changes. The uh, baseline studies are uh, of the vegetation areas, uh, and those areas are essential for being studied in monitoring the global changes. Again, the orbiter is tracking along the um, Great Lakes area to the northeast. And up here's the shoreline of one of the islands. And we can clearly see the volcanoes on those islands. These are some of the most remote volcanoes in the world and some of the least studies because of the remoteness and the difficulty of getting to them. In addition, this area is often cloud covered and makes it difficult for aerial observations or satellite observations. we get the radar set up and ready to go, it's ready to start taking data. And the next scene that you're going to see is a picture of us passing over the Sahara Desert. As you can see that to the eye, it doesn't look very like there are many features. But when you turn the radar on, this is what the radar can see underneath the ground are ancient riverbeds. Uh, and that was part of our study. This was a geological site that we wanted to understand the history of how the Sahara Desert became what it is today, because obviously its climate in the past must have been very different to have these riverbeds underneath. Now we were looking Is it uh, cloud covered at all, Dan? Take it. Is it open, wide open? Wide open. Yeah. Oh, wide great. Open. That stop's going to be 5 6. 5 6. Oh, oh man, you should hear it's told us directly right over here. I see it. I see it. I see it. I see it.
This is Mission Control Houston Endeavors tracking across the northeast portions of North America just to move uh, off the uh, coastline just to the north of Newfoundland. Views coming from the payload bay cameras uh, aboard the orbiter. Uh, I see where it is. It's, you see the pincers, and there's kind of like a little, a yep. gradual bend. Yep. It's after that gradual that bend. Gradual bend. Okay. Yeah. With a little harbor there. Yep. Yeah. Is it that cloud covered at all, Dan? Is it open, wide open? Wide open. Yeah. Oh, wide great. Open. That stop's going to be 5.6. Looks like you should have come 68 seconds. away. Endeavor on energy at the 90. Approaching 1,000 feet. And the landing gear is now down and locked. gear touchdown. And nose gear touchdown. Endeavor rolling out on runway 22, the Edwards Air Force Base facility in California. After 183 orbits of the Earth, traveling 4,703,000 miles.
Roger, we'll step endeavor and welcome home. Bakes, you and your crew have done a great job and made a significant contribution to the mission to planet Earth. We on the ground are proud of your work and proud to be a part of this flight. Well done. Castle's open. Ground speed naval auto load relief. Happy. Roger, wheel step, Endeavour, and welcome home. Bakes, you and your crew have done a great job and made a significant contribution to the mission to planet Earth. We on the ground are proud of your work and proud to be a part of this flight. Well done. Yes. Thank you very much, Houston. No Delta's flying. Copy. No close landing Delta's. We'll pick up with uh, Convoy Commander Endeavour. How do you read?